Well, as many of you know, in the United States anyway, we only have about 70 days until the election for president. And, you know, I believe there's probably still some out there who have the idea that uh, not voting at all is the correct thing to do as a Christian because they simply don't agree with either candidate. But as I've said many times, you're not voting for your new pastor or whatever the case may be. This is a secular position that uh, uh, you would vote for on, at any level. And when you're dealing with secular issues or secular people who are going to represent you as a country or as a city or state, whatever the case may be, you need to prayerfully consider the best candidate. You can't just say, well, I'm not voting for either one. Because one candidate is always better than the other when it comes to Christian values or how close they come to your Christian values. So if what you uh, are considering this year to be is bad or worse, then you need to vote for bad. Because you can bet every single person who uh, is going to be voting for worst is going to vote. So even though we only have Hillary and Donald Trump to vote for, one is worse than the other. And we absolutely know what we're going to get when we vote for, uh, vote for Hillary. If she gets in the, uh, in the uh, White House, uh, it's going to be the same thing as what you would have got with Barack Obama. And it's possible it could even be worse. But there's no question about it. It's going to be at least as bad as what Barack Obama brought to the table. And if Christians don't come to the polls and vote for Donald Trump, then the bottom line is we're going to get Hillary Clinton. Because if every Christian came to the polls and voted, we would get the better of the two candidates every single time. But if we continue not going to the polls, then before too long, it's not going to matter whether you go to the polls or not, because this nation is going to be so liberal that even if every Christian came to the polls, uh, we simply would not be able to win. So don't get in your mind that you're doing the righteous or right thing by not going to the polls and voting for either person. Because the bottom line is the vote, a non-vote, is basically a vote for Hillary Clinton. And I want to keep driving that home as much as possible until we finally go to the polls. No, I'm not in love with Donald Trump uh, either, but the bottom line is, again, we're voting between bad and worse. And I absolutely know what I'm going to get if, if uh, Hillary Clinton gets in, but I don't know what I'm going to get if Donald Trump gets in. And yes, he may be a little crude, and he may say a few things that are off color, but he's the only alternative that we have for this position, so uh, choose wisely. Now moving on to what I wanted to talk about in the first place, and uh, as I said, uh, uh, Mr. Obama is about ready to leave office, but there's a lot of chatter going on as to what he will try to do between now and his departure. And there's an article in the Jerusalem Post, it's entitled, Amid Talk of Obama Peace Push, Israel Invokes His Vow Not to Impose Solution. And what they're talking about is his, his uh, vow not to impose a two-state solution. And the article says, amid uncertainty over what Middle East steps uh, U.S. President Barack Obama may take in the twilight of his presidency, Jerusalem, according to government officials, expects him to stay true to what he said at the U.N. in 2011, which is, peace will not come through statements and resolutions at the United Nations. This issue was among those uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu discussed at his home in uh, Caesarea on Sunday with a blue-ribbon bipartisan delegation of high-ranking former national security officials. Uh, the visit comes amid speculation of what Obama was, uh, has planned for the Middle East in the two-month interim uh, between the elections uh, November 8th and when the, he formally leaves office on January the 20th. Speculation is rift with that uh, the uh, U.S. president will want to leave some kind of Middle East marker before leaving office, with options ranging from delivering a speech laying down what he believes should be the parameters of any final peace deal, to either supporting or not vetoing a new U.N. resolution on the Mideast, that would supplant UN Security Council Resolution 242 that has underpinned all peace efforts since 1967. Israel's concern is that, he, that any of these moves might be used to try and impose a solution on the, conf, or on the conflict from the outside. Government officials have in recent days highlighted Obama's 2011 speech to the UN General Assembly, which at the time was debating the uh, issue of Palestinian uh, statehood. Peace will not come through statements and resolutions at the United Nations. 
If it were that easy, it would have been accomplished long by now, he said. Ultimately, it is the Israelis and the Palestinians who must live side by side. Ultimately, it is the Israelis and the Palestinians, not us, who must reach agreement on the issues that divide them, on borders and on security, on refugees and Jerusalem. One official said that his speech was uh, Israel's reference point regarding possible Obama moves in the coming months. That speech was clear and unequivocal, and hopefully there will not be any surprises, the official said. Veteran uh, Mideast negotiator Dennis Ross, who was part of the delegation that met with Netanyahu on Sunday, said earlier this month at a Washington conference that he did not believe the administration will make a big effort uh, at the Security Council because it realizes this could only make things worse. Instead, Ross said it was likely Obama would deliver a Middle East speech, but added presidents giving speeches at the time of a term uh, end of a term, frankly, don't have that big of an impact on anybody. Well, I don't know about that. I, I would think that this might give the green light to the European Union to switch gears and to recognize the Palestinian state as a whole, meaning every individual country will uh, recognize Palestine as a state and may even put a mission or some type of diplomatic office uh, in their country. The delegation that met Netanyahu included a number of uh, national security and Middle East experts who have worked in both Republican and Democratic administrations, and some of whom uh, may be called upon to serve in various capacities by the next U.S. president. In addition to coming to Israel, the delegation also went to Saudi Arabia, where it met with King Salman uh, and to uh, Turkey and the Palestinian Authority. Now the big question is, is whether this will be a man-made peace uh, accord or whether it will be supernaturally um, created uh, after the rapture takes place. Well, certainly I do believe that God will be behind any peace uh, proposal that uh, does come about. You have to remember, the tribulation period is not Satan's period. The tribulation period is God's period, meaning that this is a time in which he will try to get as many people as uh, possible to come to know him as Lord and Savior before the Antichrist comes on the scene and declares himself to be God and presents his mark and his one world government. Now, as I've said many times, this is going to be a time of supernatural events. If remember that when the rapture takes place, that will be the first supernatural event. It will be shocking and unheard of and people will be in awe. Then when the Antichrist comes on the scene, whether or not it will be a supernatural event or not, I doubt that. I think it will probably be supernaturally directed, but it will be a, a, an agreement by and through men. But at the same time, when the Antichrist comes on the scene, two witnesses will come on the scene, and that's when supernatural events will begin to happen on earth. There will be these two men, and you know, the shocking thing is this right here. These two men will be preaching the gospel on the streets of Jerusalem, and there will literally be people who will want to kill them. And it will attempt to kill them because the Bible says that in whatever way man will try to kill them, they will be killed. So obviously men will attempt to kill uh, the two witnesses, but will be unable to until their ministry is over. But while their ministry is going on, you should know that they will be doing miraculous feats such as calling fire down from heaven, stopping the rain for periods of time, and what I believe will be the entire time of the first three and a half years. Now that might be stretching, it may be periods of time, whatever the case may be. But reading from verse 5 in chapter 11 of Revelation, it says, And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth. So, you know what? This is going to be even more supernatural than what I even believed. Because if we were to take this literally, these men are actually going to uh, have fire proceeding out of their mouth and destroying anyone who might try to destroy them. And reading on it says, And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. So whatever manner that their uh, man will try to attempt to kill them with, they're going to be killed. And reading on in verse 6, it says, These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. So from that scripture reading right there, it has to be, I believe, that they will stop the rain uh, for their entire three and a half year period. And reading on it says, And have power over waters to turn to them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. So can you imagine two men coming on the earth to whom in time the whole world will hate 
And you know, it says in verse 7 that eventually that they will be killed by the Antichrist. And then in verse 8 it says, And their dead bodies shall live in the street, uh, shall lie in the street of the great city, which is Jerusalem, which, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also, our, where also our Lord was crucified. And here's something that you should find very strange, and it says in verse 9, And they of the people of, and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves, and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts to one another because of these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. So can you imagine what kind of society will be on earth during this time that people will rejoice over, worldwide, will rejoice over these two men dying and that they will actually attempt to kill them. With a, and it sounds like to me no protection given to them whatsoever. You know, if today if there was someone that we just, we dislike, uh, they could uh, go to any town square or the White House and they could have police protection. And even though men may try to kill them or whatever the case may be, the police would protect them. But this is a different society altogether where the world powers and the police and the military just allow people to try to attempt to try to kill these men. And it would not shock me that they had already tried, the militaries of the world, but weren't able to. And the fact that at the end of their ministry that the Antichrist finally is able to kill them means that probably, they probably had an army behind him or whatever the case may be and God finally allowed them to be killed. And you know, after the Antichrist kills the uh, two prophets, three days later they're going to, three and a half days later they're going to rise up and they are going to stand on their feet. And the Bible says that great fear fell upon everyone who saw them. Now you got to remember, this is a society in which uh, these men have been in on the streets of Jerusalem for three and a half days and not being allowed to be buried. Can you imagine that happening in today's society? So you'll have, you know, this is a situation in which this is a very lawless and wicked society that simply is going to be much different than what I believe is going on today. But again, it will also be a supernatural society as well. And you have to remember, at the same time, witnesses will be going throughout the world preaching the gospel in every man's tongue, I believe. Uh, God will send uh, Jews from it all over the, to all over the world and to preach the gospel. Now, whether or not God will allow them to be able to speak whatever language that they're in, where whatever country they're in, when they get there, or these Jews will be actually from these countries and will uh, preach the gospel on their own streets. That's unknown, but we know there's going to be 144,000 of them. And they will be all male and unmarried. And um, so basically those are the qualifications of that 144,000. But on top of that, as I've always said, there'll be angels flying throughout the air preaching the gospel in every man's tongue. So everyone during this time will hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and will make a decision one way or the other. And in the end, if they don't make a decision for Christ, they're going to make a decision for the Antichrist. And you know, that's what the tribulation period is all about. Is God saying for, to, to man one last time, listen, you're either going to serve me or you're going to serve Satan. And if you don't serve me, you're going to end up in a burning hell. And you know, there's a lot, always a lot of talk about what the great deception is found in 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, 9 through 11. But the truth of the matter is, it tells that what the great deception is, and that is that they rejected the love of the truth. And the love of the truth is salvation. Because it ends up saying that they might be saved. Well, you know, a lot of uh, post-rapture uh, or post-trib or pre-rathers, they got this crazy idea that it's the belief of the pre-tribulation rapture that's going to be the great deception. And, you know, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. But bottom line is God wants everyone to be saved. That's why he's sending out all of these messengers and supernatural messengers to tell everyone who will listen that they need to come to the Lord as Savior. And many will come to know the Lord as Savior, but many more will do will not come to the Lord. And that from there, because of that, when the Antichrist does come on the scene, they will believe the, the great deception by the Antichrist, which is that Jesus is not Lord, but that Satan and the Antichrist is Lord. But as you can see from their great hatred toward the two witnesses, that's really not them that they're, that they're expressing their hatred toward. It's toward God. Man will hate God that much that he, you know, they know what the message is. The message is that Jesus is Lord. But the world will hate that message so much that they will refuse this message and in turn, when the time comes, will take on 
the uh, message of the Antichrist and declare him to be a god. So even a few years into the tribulation period, the supernatural settings and people that are, will be alive during that time will be commonplace. And I'm sure that many will, uh, you know, that are listening to this may not believe that the two witnesses will have fire shooting from their mouths, but the Bible says that there, that will be the case. So imagine with me two guys that are on the streets of Jerusalem. Somebody tries to kill them, and fire proceeds from their mouth and destroys them before they can. Also imagine that they've stopped the rain. They've, they're sending plagues as much as they want. They're turning uh, uh, the rivers to, to blood. So this is a time in which the Antichrist uh, was about ready to come on the scene. It's not going to be a normal time period. And it certainly won't be a time of being politically correct because the bottom line is, is who in the world, what society would allow th two men to lie on the streets of any city for three and a half days without them having a proper burial or whatever the case may be? You know, I just have to believe in, in, in that particular situation uh, tells us that this is going to be a, a period of time in which we simply don't understand today. And, you know, a lot of people try to humanize the uh, tribulation period, but you simply can't do that. There are simply too many things going on during the tribulation period that cannot be explained through human means. The Bible describes it as a supernatural time, and I have to believe that. But I'm going to close it up right here and tell you that uh, I do believe that Mr. Obama is going to do something at the last hour that could be detrimental to Israel, whether it be not vetoing a resolution or giving his stamp of approval to a resolution, or just outlining a plan of attack in order to create a Palestinian state, uh, declaring borders or whatever the case may be. But I will be keeping an eye on Mr. Obama and seeing what he does do once the elections are over, especially if it turns out that Donald Trump does win. And believe it or not, that's only a few months away, so we don't have that much time to wait. And if you don't know the Lord, today is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. You know, 150,000 people die every single day. The Bible says that the vast majority will end up in a burning hell. And why is that? Because they didn't declare the Lord as their Savior. They didn't take on his free gift that he gave on Calvary. You know, Jesus died for your sins. He asked that you accept that free gift and begin living for him. And if you haven't done that today, I would encourage you to do so. And friends, Christians, I would uh, encourage you to get a copy of my Tribulation Period Survival Guide. You know, there's two versions, a free version and a paid version, depending on what your goal is. I don't know if you know this or not, but now I have eight different versions of the Tribulation Period Survival Guide, meaning there's, it's written in eight different languages. And you, the Calvary uh, Prophecy Report listeners, help make that possible. And we're looking at right now uh, adding another language, uh, Portuguese, and if you'd like to give toward that cause, you can do so by going to my uh, PayPal account and giving. If you want to do something like that, get a hold of me through email or whatever the case may be, and I will give you instructions on how you can give. And if you haven't created your rapture cabinet yet that you can place by your door in case of rapture break glass, I would encourage you to do so. If you have made one, you should shoot me an email along with pictures so I can see how you uh, created yours. It's not that difficult to make, and I would encourage every single one of you to put one not only in your home, by the door, but also in your church. Well, this is Terry Malone with the Calvary Prophecy Report.